Planet Earth is remarkable in how it sustains us, but it is restless, and as a consequence, it presents many challenges. I am fascinated by the deep ocean trenches and soaring mountains that are hallmarks of the Pacific Rim. So why should somebody in the eastern U.S. care about processes happening in the rim of the Pacific, the so-called Ring of Fire? Well, the Ring of Fire hosts very distinct geological hazards, and these hazards have a tendency to spur cascading disasters, which have very broad impacts, including global impacts. Hi, I'm John Lewis, and I'm a professor of geology in the Department of Geography, Geology, Environment, and Planning at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. In the next 10 minutes, I hope to convince you that paying attention to the Pacific Rim is, in fact, important. Okay, we'll start with a map of the Pacific, and this is a map that I plotted uh, that shows actually the velocity of positions on the Earth's surface, which sounds a little bit abstract. But the, the arrows that are shown here, there are a bunch of them in, in, in the western U.S., in California and up the coast, they show the speed that those parts of the world are moving with respect to North America. So imagine North America is fixed. So if you put a very, very precise survey instrument in Minneapolis and Nashville and St. Louis, you would see that those stations are not moving with respect to each other. Once you cross the San Andreas Fault, which everybody is quite familiar with, the folks in that part of California on the coast are actually living on the Pacific Plate. And they're moving at about 48 millimeters per year to the northwest. So that's what that air, those arrows show. They show the movement of the Pacific Plate relative to North America. And you can see that Hawaii is moving even faster. So what are the consequences of this movement of the entire Pacific Basin? Well, that is uh, its own tectonic plate. And the tectonic plate is moving toward the northwest. And it has to go somewhere. And it runs into the plate that is to the north and west. And that's where places like Alaska, the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia, Japan, those are the places that have to be on the receiving end. So what happens? A subduction zone is created, and that is where the oceanic plate of the Pacific gets pushed down into the mantle. So you can see that the velocity is pretty consistent across the Pacific Basin, and there's a deep dark blue line all the way around the Pacific in the north and the west, and that is a deep ocean trench. So they're very deep, they're very long, and there's a lot of water there, as you can imagine. Some of the other familiar things that happen in subduction zones are volcanoes and earthquakes. The next slide shows the locations of earthquakes for a couple of few decades. There are thousands and thousands of earthquakes. They're shown as blue dots. In fact, if you plotted a map of the earthquakes all around the globe, you would pretty much have a handle on where the active plate boundaries are on the Earth. This part of the, re of the Earth, the Pacific Basin, is surrounded by subduction zones and places like the San Andreas Fault, and they produce earthquakes. Earthquakes are, of course, very damaging. This animation from IRIS shows some of the key uh, features involved with the production of a, of a tsunami. At a subduction zone, the, the water is very deep, the deep ocean trenches I spoke of earlier. The plates are converging, and one plate is moving underneath the other into the deeper part of the Earth. It's kind of being recycled. But the plates are interacting frictionally, and that means that the upper plate gets shorter and shorter, and, and when a big earthquake occurs, it springs toward the ocean, and that displaces a large volume of water where the oceans are the deepest. That means you've got a very large amount of water involved with this energy pulse, and that gets distributed around the entire ocean basin, often with incredibly devastating uh, outcomes. And in 2011, you might be familiar, there was a very large earthquake in the northern part of Japan called the Tohoku Oki earthquake. Oki means great. So it was one of the largest ever recorded earthquakes, a magnitude nine. This was not that long ago, 12 years or so ago. And that caused an incredibly big earthquake followed by a tsunami. So minutes after the ground was shaken and infrastructure failed, very, very scary for people, of course, then a surge of water came across the landscape that it was completely devastated. This is the Daiichi nuclear power plant. And this is a very important example of what I referred to as a kind of cascading disasters. First, the ground shook, and that's going to be very difficult when it's a magnitude nine earthquake. Of course, many of the systems could have been damaged. But soon thereafter, the entire coast was inundated by a tidal wave or a tsunami. 
and that took out all of the normal operating processes at the power plant. That meant that the power plant could not do normal things like keeping spent fuel cool. The result of that was a meltdown. So we have now got a nuclear a radionuclide disaster on top of the human loss and all of the other sorts of things that happened in the wake of this magnitude 9 earthquake. So this has a downstream effect on even the economy. Research following the Tohoku Oki earthquake has shown that the impacts on the global economy were very significant. Locally, of course, the, the supply chain was disrupted uh, immediately. But the ripple through effects affected even uh, North America and the US economy quite profoundly. So there are far field effects related to these types of cascading disasters. So I wanna turn now to the other side of the Pacific uh, to uh, something closer to home, and that is Mount St. Helens. In, in the year 1980, in March, the Mount St. Helens region started to see some an uptick in activity around this volcanic feature, a very beautiful mountain, quite famous. And by uh, May, this, the geology community was very concerned and they were trying to close the region and they were closing roads and, and trying to take precautions. On May 18th, a magnitude five earthquake, about 5.1 earthquake, caused the flank of the north side of the volcano to collapse and in, in what has been described as the largest landslide ever recorded. After that, the magma system underneath was now sort of free to explode and pop open. So what happened was a lateral blast occurred and it moved toward the north at something on the order of 300 miles per hour and it destroyed everything. And in fact, it killed David Johnston, who was a U.S. Geological Survey geologist who was there. The image on the left is the view he had from his observation point. And the view on the right is the same location after the, after the eruption. It's important to note that this is another example of this sort of cascading set of processes. An earthquake caused a landslide and that unleashed, basically unleashed a volcano, kind of like taking a cork out of a champagne bottle. And it's important to know that this volcano is very small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, this is a region that does, uh, has a lot of hazards and it's close to home as, I, as you know. Um, importantly also, the volcanic system produces beautifully fertile soils. So many of you may well know that the economy of Eastern Oregon and Washington is tied to agriculture. Lots of fruit is produced there. And that is a result of periodic eruptions from volcanoes. So, so there's good and bad that goes with volcanic activity. The things that people have to pay attention to include volcanic eruptions in places that nobody can see it, like in the remote parts of Alaska. The ash that goes into the stratosphere can very easily take down a jet aircraft flying through it. And most air traffic that goes to Asia goes over the Aleutian Islands. So there's a lot of people that are paying attention to those kinds of things. Another feature of this part of the world that we call the Cascadia subduction zone is that in 1700, in January of 1700, so just over 300 years ago, a, a, a likely magnitude 9 earthquake occurred. It caused a tsunami which went to northern Japan and did great damage to coastal communities and, and harbor towns. And they didn't experience the earthquake, so they referred to it as an orphan tsunami. It is documented in oral traditions from the indigenous peoples of the coastal Alaska and British Columbia and Washington and even into northern California and Oregon. So it's, it was known. Uh, an event of that sort today would be quite devastating. And so the U.S. Geological Survey puts a lot of effort into trying to be prepared for those kinds of uh, uh, unfortunate events. So in closing, I hope that now you understand that uh, the effects of Pacific Rim geological processes have ripple through effects. They cause cascading challenges to us. And they're not just in the Pacific Basin, they can be indeed global. So hopefully I've piqued your interest. If so, I would love to see you in a class in our department at some point in the future. The department is geography, geology, environment, and planning. Thank you.